Good evening, everyone. Uh, can people hear me in the back rows? Yes. <clears throat> Welcome to our event tonight, a dialogue on the question, what kind of health care system should the U.S. adopt? A dialogue with our very distinguished guests, David Craig and Joan Tronto. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm Professor of Religion and Philosophy at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute that's sponsoring our event tonight. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and encourage free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public by exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society, the Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easy or comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. For help in organizing our event tonight, special thanks go to Shannon Regeer, Greg Seams, Jim May, Carrie Vanderveen, Andrea Galswick, Brianne Jans, <coughs> Jeff O'Donnell and the broadcast crew, the facilities team, Dana Thompson, our student workers, Rebecca DeBoer, Mari Arneson, Catherine Hinderocker, and Haley Marquette. Professors Ashley Hodgson and Jason Marsh for helping us with this programming. And all the students and professors of St. Olaf Courses who are participating specially in our event tonight. I also want to thank those St. Olaf faculty, too many to be mentioned here. Uh, who were part of a stimulating three-session seminar on the topic of freedom, community, and healthcare. That seminar took place last February and March and was conducted in anticipation of Institute events this spring, including our event tonight. Our dialogue this evening is the third in an Institute series of four spring term events on the theme of freedom, community, and healthcare. In early March, we heard Dr. Joanne Lin speak with passion erudition and experience about the problem of elder care in our society. Later in that month, we heard Professor Gilbert Mylander speak with superb dialectical precision and practical wisdom on the problem of palliative sedation. And a week from now, on April 26th, the Institute sponsors a second dialogue on the topic we are addressing tonight, <clears throat> a conversation in that case between two distinguished economists Amitabh Chandra of Harvard University and Tyler Cowen of George Mason University, who will address again the question, what healthcare system should the US adopt? But now to introduce this evening's speakers. First, David Craig. David Craig is an ethicist, a professor of religious studies, and former Thomas H. Lake scholar in religion and philanthropy at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. He's the author of John Ruskin and the Ethic of Consumption that was published in 2006 by the University of Virginia Press. And most pertinent to our topic tonight, he's the author of Healthcare as a Social Good, Religious Values in American Democracy, published in 2014 by Georgetown University Press. In his book on healthcare, Professor Craig argues that healthcare is best understood in contemporary American society. Not as a private benefit, not as a private choice, not as a public right, but rather as a social good, a social good whose realization requires a deep sense of communally shared responsibility and social solidarity. He comes to this conclusion in part through ethical analysis, but also through extensive interviews with hospital administrators, caregivers, and interfaith activists from different political parties across the nation Interviews that he believes help us discern at least an implicit social consensus about healthcare as a shared social good. He ends his book with a qualified defense of the approach to healthcare reflected in the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, including the controversial individual mandate portion of that act, while he acknowledges that in certain dimensions, Obamacare will require some adjustments. Joan Tronto is professor of political science at the University of Minnesota. She teaches in the political science and the gender, women, and sexuality studies departments at the U. She's also a member of the affiliate faculty at the University of Minnesota Center for Bioethics. 
She was pre previously a professor of women's studies and political science at Hunter College and the Graduate School City University of New York. <clears throat> Her books include Moral Boundaries, A Political Argument for an Ethic of Care, published by Routledge in 1993, Caring Democracy, Markets, Equality, and Justice, published by uh, New York University Press in 2013, and Who Cares, How to Reshape a Democratic Politics, published by Cornell University Press in 2015. As the titles of these books indicate, Professor Tronto has been concerned especially with reorienting our thinking about democracy in a way that puts care and caring at the center of that thinking. Her view is that health care, with an emphasis on care, has taken a backseat to politics and economics narrowly construed, with troubling consequences for our health care system. Her writings call for substantial social and political reform, and she urges a radical re-envisioning of democratic citizenship as precisely participation in caring relations. On the matter of what kind of healthcare system we ought to have, she is prepared to defend a single payer option, of course, government as the single payer. I might add that while there are differences between our speakers tonight, for example, on the single payer option, they are nonetheless united in their skepticism about the use of market forces as the exclusive or primary way to resolve the problems of our healthcare system. For example, achieving healthcare quality mainly through competition among healthcare providers in a free market system. In this respect, they are at one in differing with our speakers for next week, who see an important, if not central, role for the market in managing healthcare delivery. So the seminar discussion continues. Uh, next week, the other side in some large sense of the question. But right now, will you please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest speakers, David Craig and Joan Tronto. <laughs> Just a few brief remarks about the format tonight. We're going to begin with um, 10 minute opening remarks by uh, Professor Craig, uh, Professors Craig and Tronto. And then we will move to about a 20 minute exchange between them. Uh, and then in the remainder of the time, we will open it up to Q&A from the general audience. So, Professor Craig, you could start. Thank you very much, Edmund. I want to thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to thank Greg and Shannon for making this an easy trip and the Institute for host hosting this dialogue and all of the interesting dialogues. And I want to thank you all for being here. So uh, I appreciate your time. I am, this, we have a very weighty question in front of us today. Uh, honestly, it's a question that raises more questions in my mind than answers. But I'm going to do my best to lay down some answers that I think we can use to try to think through this question about what kind of healthcare system the US should adopt. <clears throat> and the way I think about this is, I think that when you're thinking about a national healthcare system, political culture and policy history matter. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with this idea that the history of health policy in our country is important and the political culture of our country is important if we're trying to think about changes that we can make in the healthcare system. So I'm going to open with two very brief historical stories uh, and I'm going to try to say that these stories indicate that certain values, as Ed was pointing out, this is what I think, certain values have been written into the healthcare system as it exists today. And then I'm gonna say why there's resistance to change, and then some values that I think can move us forward. So that's what I'm gonna try to do here <clears throat> in the beginning. So the first historical story I wanna tell is the story of public investment in healthcare. I did this research project uh, I had no idea how many different ways we fund healthcare through public channels when I began this project. We tend to think we have a my healthcare system, my benefits, my coverage, my physician, or my fees, my training, my. We have an our healthcare system. We pay for it together, we share it together, and that's what I learned. <clears throat> so, uh, in building this healthcare system, Paul Starr, uh, in his Social History of American Medicine, talks about three stages 
of how the healthcare system was built. The first stage is the stage of expansion. And public funding expanded healthcare in this country dramatically by funding medical research, by funding medical training, by building hospitals, by funding infrastructure. Uh, when people go to medical school today, they are subsidized six to one by public. It's an amazing investment in medical training we don't talk about. Uh, the second stage of this was an effort at equity. Medicare is a good example of trying to be more equitable, helping people in the system who not, might not have been able to get in. Uh, and people generally see the Children's Health Insurance Program as a similar effort at equity, too. The third stage in Starr's story is cost control. The United States has done very poorly at cost control. Um, we've invested a lot in excellence and innovation, two important values. We've invested some in equity. Uh, we've also invested in inclusion and compassion through safety net, Medicaid, and other kinds of programs. We've done terrible at cost control. One of the really attractive features of Medicare for All is it looks like the trifecta. It's expansion, it's equity, and it's cost control. And so this is, these are really big attractive aspects of the single payer idea and Medicare for All. I'll come back and say why I'm skeptical of that later. Okay, so that's the first historical story I just wanna lay out there. The second historical story I wanna put out there is one that I, I take using an idea from John Dewey, who's an American pragmatist and philosopher, and he wrote a book called The Public and Its Problems. And one of the things he says in this book is there's not one public, there are many publics. And what he meant by a public is a public is a group that forms to try to manage consequences of private behavior that affect other people. Sometimes they're good consequences like education, or sometimes they're bad consequences like the environment. And so a public forms to support policies that build policy gains, but they also support moral values. And that's that second piece that I really wanna stress. <clears throat> policy gains and moral values. There are three main publics in the United States today that are obstacles to healthcare reform. And you might be a member of one of these publics because the first one is working Americans with health insurance. This is a group of people who got tremendous benefits and get tremendous benefits from the government in the, form of, uh, in the form of tax deductions. And there's a moral language that goes with this, which is that people deserve the security of employer health benefits. Of course, so long as they work, right? Or so long as they work in jobs that provide those benefits. So this is one public, working Americans with health insurance. The second public is Medicare recipients. Um, Medicare recipients with universal public insurance, there's an, a commitment here, a shared responsibility to vulnerable people, elderly people and disabled people, even though that's a guaranteed benefit, Medicaid, right? Medicare, Medicaid, <laughs> right? Deserved benefit, undeserved entitlement. We hear that moral language behind the policy. The third public that's deeply invested in the healthcare status quo is anyone who goes into the specialist intensive, high tech, acute care healthcare system that we've built with hospitals at the center and enormous public investments in them. So here the idea is uh, we want excellent innovative medicine that saves lives, right? So I wanna emphasize that these, these moral languages are good moral languages, right? People deserve health benefits. We should, be, we should have shared responsibility to protect the vulnerable, right? We want the best medicine to save lives. These are really important moral languages. But the problem is these languages can be used to stop political change, <clears throat> and they're used all the time to do so. So I want to suggest some slightly different values, again, just to kind of lay the groundwork here, and maybe we can begin to think about these values instead of some of the other values. And just to review, I talked about excellence and innovation. I talked about equity. I talked about inclusion and compassion, and also cost control. So one set of values that I think is really important as we look ahead is personal choice and wellness. Now we often hear the language of personal choice and responsibility, and you're gonna hear a lot of that next week. 
what's responsibility about? Responsibility is for wellness. So why don't we just jump to wellness? Why don't we build a system around personal choice and wellness? And why don't, why don't we invest our money there to build that kind of a system? The second uh, set of values that I think are important, uh, deserved security of benefits. But not just for people who get it through their employers, universally deserved security of publicly defined benefits. The Affordable Care Act defines public benefits package. And this needs to be universalized and it needs to be seen as deserved. <clears throat> Another uh, idea, shared responsibility. Yeah, but let's make it universal shared responsibility across the system. Again, the Affordable Care Act does spread re shared responsibility a little bit more, but we also really need to make sure there's progressive funding of that shared responsibility. Innovation, innovation's great. We all want innovation, but I would suggest we want innovation for good health outcomes. Not just innovation for innovation's sake, but innovation for good health outcomes overall. Excellence, I think excellence is also really important, but we want excellence in integrative, supportive care. Not just any kind of care, but the kind of care that promotes wellness. And then the last value I'm gonna state before stopping is solidarity. Edmund mentioned that I think healthcare change is gonna happen if we can all look at each other and say, this is our healthcare system. We pay for it together. We pay for one another. Americans built it together through public funding. So how are we gonna make it work for everybody? But solidarity isn't enough. It has to be affordable solidarity. Because if you only have solidarity without putting limits, you're not going to be able to have a, you're not going to have a healthcare system that's sustainable. We've got to figure out how to set limits in terms of how we do healthcare and and uh, distribute it in our country. So those are the values that I am suggesting we need to think about as we build a healthcare system going forward. I'll have more to say about specific health policies, uh, single payer market reform as we as we dial it. Okay, so this is gonna be fun. The religion <laughs> professor is telling you all to be realistic <laughs> and to think about limits and how we have to be, pay attention to the past and where we are in policy debates. I'm a political scientist, but I'm really a political theorist. And frankly, I'm gonna take the utopian route here because it seems to me that we have to start from this fact. The American healthcare system is really broken. It is badly broken broken. It is the most expensive healthcare system in the country, in the world, and we do not get the kinds of outcomes that you would expect from spending more than anyone else. So a lot of this money is going someplace that isn't actually helping. And the question is, is there a way to redo this? The way to fix a completely broken system is not to say this is what the historical evidence is, yes, um, the way to fix it is to say, let's start over. And the way to start over is to say that what we need is a single payer national health insurance system. Something known as Medicare for All, I'd endorse HR 676, which has been sitting in the US Congress for a very long time. It provides all residents of the US would cover, be covered for medically necessary services, doctor, hospital, preventive, long-term care, mental health, reproductive health care, dental, vision, prescription drug, and medical supply costs. It's pretty comprehensive. Okay. Specifically, I would also favor what's called the global funding mechanism in which private entities provide the services and they do it and get paid for a certain amount based on what it costs to fix somebody in that particular area rather than the fee-for-service system because it provides incentives for them to look overall at people's health and to fix their situation. Now, I'm not an expert in health policy, and I'm not an economist, I'm a political theorist, but what I wanna do is to make the case to you, not just about solidarity, because that's just a word, but to make the case for you that there really is a reason for people to think differently about health care, emphasis on care. 
Human societies all operate on the basis that people care for each other. If they didn't, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here, we all would have died as infants. All of us need care every day. We need all, as m most of us in this room are probably self-sustaining adults, we dress ourselves, we feed ourselves, we do those activities of daily living by ourselves, but we're still caring for ourselves. Every day, everyone needs to be cared for. And the idea of creating, and, and here's the interesting thing. As human societies became more democratic, they had to incorporate the interests of new people. When workers became, democrat, became citizens, suddenly their health care actually became part of the public agenda. Social security became part of the public agenda. When women became citizens, suddenly all that care work that had been done in private and left out became part of the public agenda. And we have not solved the problem of what to do if everyone in society participates fully as citizens, who's going to do the care work? My answer is we all have to step up and do it. And that also means we all have to pay for it. So the radical solution to the problem of who's going to do the caring work is caring democracy. It requires that we negotiate the delicate balances of how much time and effort various citizens get to spend doing public things and economic things, how much time they get to spend doing care work. Um, at the present, all of these things are deeply divided by gender, race, and class. And we can't forget that ever, because what happens in caring happens also in healthcare. People with the less <coughs> favored economic, racial, gender groups get worth worse healthcare in the United States. So the vocabulary I want to use is not the vocabulary of moral values per se, but of citizenship, inclusion, and equality. Healthcare and care responsibilities have to be negotiated by all. So let me make three arguments for a single payer. The first one is an economic argument. Instituting single payer will disrupt an immense economic sector. There is no doubt about that. The military, um, C.W. Stevens called the medical industrial complex the military industrial complex of our era. And so there's going to be a huge amount of disruption, but I want to argue to you it's worth it. It's worth it because single payer focuses on people's medical needs, not on the interests of profit making or nonprofit companies. It's, I'm sorry, you know, I'm a simple thinker. Think about what matters. What matters are meeting people's health care needs, not meeting the profit margins of companies or even the nonprofit interests of other providers. Market fundamentalism, to me, misses out on the points about the nature of health care. First of all, there's always a knowledge problem in things like health care. Consumers don't know best. Um, I read The Economist occasionally. There's a guy who or a woman who writes as Schumpeter, I like that, um, and talks about rent seeking in behavior in healthcare. This is a quote. The dark side is that pockets of rent seeking have become endemic in America's economy. Wherever products are too complex for customers to understand and where subsidies and complex regulation add to the muddle, huge profits can opaquely be made. Now, Schumpeter only says it's probably about 6% of the, of the health care budget, but that's a tremendous amount of money that could be used to other purposes if we just took the renting out of the middle levels of management in the way the profit system now works. Now, economists will tell you, oh, we have a way to fix asymmetry, uh, but it requires that the doctors are acting in the best interests of patients. Well, you know what? The doctors are also caught in this incredibly complex system that they can't figure out either. Making a system that's simple, straightforward, would make it much better. Um, there is no free market in healthcare, and don't let anyone tell you there is, as, as David said. Somewhere around 48% minimally under the lowest estimates of healthcare is already paid for by the government. So we're working in a system that is partly public, partly private, and guess who's making the decisions about how to game it so that they get the benefits? Well, it's the oligopolistic nature of the healthcare market. This is not a free market, this is a market of big oligopolies. Um, and they're the ones who are making, 
hand over fist profits. Um, yes, they're doing some remarkable innovation, but ask yourself this question. If you were someone who was a fantastic statistician and could figure out how to improve the healthcare outcomes of a particular population by running a statistical data program, even if you couldn't sell it to United Healthcare, wouldn't you still invent it? Maybe you wouldn't, but I bet you would. <laughs> Finally, the ex this is another piece about the cost of health care. We focus a lot on medicine and on medical care and on the high tech stuff. And frankly, I'm alive because of it. I'm happy about it. Yeah. But on the other yeah. hand, on the other hand, the externality of care is a real cost that we're going to have to begin to pay attention to in the health care system. People get sent home with IVs and told, okay, you figure out how this works. I don't think we can do that anymore. So Second argument, the quality of health care will be improved. I, I think it's fair to say that health care is, basic health care is cheaper than relying on emergency room care. Providing basic care for everybody makes it possible for everyone to be well cared for, and then you cut down on the number of people who are using the emergency room as their primary care physicians. Those are the kinds of things that are driving up health care costs. And chronic health care costs are among the greatest. But in a fee-for-service system, there's no incentive to lower that. This example uh, <clears throat> comes to me from, comes to me. Someone who has asthma may get admitted to the hospital four times in the course of a summer. If you bought them an air conditioner, which isn't part of the healthcare system, but if you bought them an air conditioner because you were, you're being paid by the person to take care of them, um, you would actually probably reduce the seriousness of their asthma, it's a lot cheaper than someone spending time in the hospital. So we really need to think differently about our bodies. We need to think differently about the long arc of our lives. And we have to stop thinking that what we need is for someone is to know that at some point we may get catastrophically ill and then we're not going to be able to be cared for. You'll be able to be cared for if you're catastrophically ill. But in the meantime, we've skewed everything in that direction. Let me end then by saying there's a public duty as citizens that we share to make health care equal, affordable, and accessible. Unequal access to and provision of health care continues the vicious circles of inequality in American society. To make caring democracy possible, we have to break this vicious circle. The uninsured, after all, remember, are most likely to be poor. The latest work from political psychologists suggests that people who live in more unequal societies have harsher, negative, moral judgments of others. I find that really chilling because it means it really does become a vicious circle. If you are in an unequal society, you think that other people are not as good as you and therefore they don't have this dessert. The solution is that when government is generous, people become more generous. There's a wonderful book by Suzanne Mettler, Citizens, sorry, Soldiers to Citizens, in which she talks about the GI Bill, which was kind of an accident, you know? They didn't think that eight million people would take advantage of it, but they did. But the people she interviewed made it clear that after World War II, having been given these really generous benefits to go to college or to buy a mortgage or to get training, they gave back. They're the people we call the greatest generation, and they're the people who passed Medicare. It's not an accident. Circles of generosity revolve around themselves. So single-payer health care is the way for us to go. It's a great place for us to break the cycle of uncaring. It's economically more viable, results in better health care outcomes, and addresses gaps of inequality in our democracy. Incrementalism will not work as long as profit and oligopolistic healthcare systems carry so much weight. To use this metaphor, which is based, of course, on Warren Buffett's claim, it's time to swallow the harsh medicine and get rid of the tapeworm on American economic competitiveness. Thank you. Um, David, um would you like to respond sure. to him, Joan? So let's start with the, 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 the title of the bill, which is Medicare for All. I'm a big supporter of equal, affordable, accessible care. 
Uh, Medicare for all is, is an attractive term, partly because everybody, at least who uh, pays into the Medicare system, that is pretty much everybody in the United States, can look forward to Medicare later in life. So it's, it, it's a universal program. Um, it provides benefits. It's secure. People support it. Right? So the proposal is to take the same benefits that Medicare recipients are getting today and let other people have them. No, that is not what the proposal is. Medicare, Medicare has co-pays. Medicare has premiums. Medicare does not cover vision. Medicare does not cover mental health. Medicare does not cover all of these services. So you have to, first of all, acknowledge that what's being proposed is not Medicare. In Canada, which has the single-payer system that people know best, the single-payer system pays for hospital and physician, and that's it. It does not cover these other benefits. That's why people have private insurance that complement what the government covers. Another important thing to say about Canada is it's not a federal system. It's paid for by the provinces. Each province pays 70% about of the cost of the healthcare system, and it's run at a provincial level because it's deemed to be too difficult to run a healthcare system at a national level. The largest single-payer healthcare system in, in the world is Medicare. Medicare, for people who um, are about 70 years old, can expect a four-to-one payout based on the Medicare taxes they've paid. This is unsustainable. You have to have a system that you can pay into that is sustainable. So what's being promised here is an expansionist program. And it's really unclear where the money is going to come from. It's promised that you're going to get more for less because you'll cut out administrative waste. We'll negotiate drug prices, which is very important to do. I completely support both of these goals. But the promise is there's going to be enough money there to bring everybody in without increasing the costs. And it sounds really good, doesn't it? But the history of our country has been expansionist at every single turn. We have not learned to control costs. And so I am very skeptical that a Medicare for all system, which is expansionist to begin with, which in fact is misrepresented, uh, is actually going to get us there for the dollar price that people are paying. So that's my first concern about Medica Medicare for all. I have others, but maybe I will pass the mic. Okay, I began by saying, I <laughs> saying what I meant by single payer, which is yep. it includes all those things. Yep. Okay, so, okay, it's not Medicare, it's bigger, you're right. Um, it's more expensive, maybe. Here's the difference. We have to go back and ask the question, uh, you know, do you know the language that, econ forgive me, economists use about this is to talk about what they call a moral hazard. I, I you know, I have to say that language just throws me off. Moral hazard means that people will use something more because it's available. I think that's actually a good thing with healthcare. Um, if people use more healthcare at the low level, they get healthier. If government, is, if you're interested in cutting down on medical, on medical costs, the way to do that is to increase the amount of money you spend on health. And by health, we also mean sustainable health. So it's not just uh, when someone comes to the hospital and they've got diabetes, that you kind of start putting them on dialysis. Think about the fact that for the last 25 years, they haven't been eating properly or exercising properly. Once again, these things are related to class in the US. And the people who are poorest are the ones who are most likely to be driving up these expenses. Somewhere around, what's the number? Somewhere around, um, is it 20% of patients end up costing about 50% of the medical costs? Huh? It's more. And, it, it, and it's because some people get really, really sick. 
we know enough to be able to fix that if we had a health system that were comprehensive in trying to address those questions. So that's why I don't think that we're going to talk. We, we talk, we're going to talk about runaway costs forever. Initially, of course, when every, in every country in the world that's moved towards a more like a single payer system, and for me the best example is not Canada but South Korea, as people move to, as countries move towards a single payer system, um, they discover that the first few, ten years, five years, ten years, um, costs go up because people are, who have been putting off getting health care suddenly sign up. But after that, it levels out. Most of the, about half of the healthcare costs most human beings incur in their lives are incurred in the last year of life. That's a remarkable thing, because as you're getting older, you're getting sicker. But part of that is the attitude we have, frankly, about healthcare and about the ways in which we're gonna use healthcare to solve the problems we haven't solved in our lives. Um, there's a commercial on TV now that started during the Super Bowl, maybe you've seen it, where they say, suppose you only get one car in your life, you would take good care of that car. It drives me crazy because your body is not a car. <laughs> and your life is not a car. But that's how they're asking us to think about the analogy. And it works because that is how we think about our bodies. One of the movements that's been really interesting to me is the so-called slow medicine movement where people who are aged and have some terminal disease think differently about, you know, should, in fact, I go through this horrible kind of treatment that may extend my life by another three months, or should I figure out some other things that I have to do? In a society that we're genuinely caring, we would be able to do different things in those last months of life. Example, we might be able to take medical, take leave from our jobs uh, to take care of sick, our sick parents. And then having us around, our parents would be easier to go. These kinds of things are, the whole system is predicated as, on this idea that if you spend more money on a problem of the body, then you're going to get a better healthcare outcome. But that's not true. And only we have to change that attitude in order for healthcare costs to come down and to contain costs. But it's not a question about cost, it's a question about our way we think about our health. And that's not going to change as long as people feel that they're in this precarious situation where, yeah, employer healthcare is fine until you lose your job. Mm -hmm. And then you're really in trouble. Um, and as long as people are feeling, uh, or you work at a place where you're never going to get health insurance, and I hate to say it, but increasingly that's going to be the kind of workforce that we have. The more we're looking at those kinds of, if you think your life is in a precarious state, the chances that you're going to say to the doctor, do more, do more, do more, are much greater. Whereas if you feel somehow that your life has meaning, satisfaction, you can be with your loved ones, if we support those kinds of things, we're much more likely to be in a place where we can contain healthcare costs. Not everybody in the Netherlands or in Canada who I know run to the doctor um, the way that I do, or the way that Mar Americans do. And if we were able to kind of change our way of thinking about what it means to use the healthcare system, we'd be much better at, cha at containing costs than in these, than in other proposals. I, I agree with um, what Joan's saying there at the end very strongly. One of the people I interviewed said it quite memorably, we don't have a healthcare system, we have a sick care system. And this is, this is a deep problem that we face. And it, 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 it infiltrates everything. It infiltrates how people are trained as physicians. It affects what's valued in research. Right? All the research dollars are for precision medicine, high-tech fixes, very relatively little for thinking about health system change. Right? Where do you get the rewards? Uh, in community medicine or in the hospital? We have this idea that medicine is about saving lives. But medicine is actually about keeping people well. That's really what it's about. It's about keeping people well. And in that, in that vein, I think it's less important who's paying than what we're paying for what. That's really the key issue. It's not who's paying. The issue is 
What are we paying for what? And this is going to require a revolutionary transformation in terms of how we pay for everything from mental health through pharmaceuticals to uh, physician health, hospital health, hospice, palliative care, you name it. There has to be a radical change in terms of how we think about what we're trying to pay for. And that's why it's so important to, to put the priorities of wellness, prevention, chronic disease management, integrated care, community care, front and center. So then the question becomes, how do you get there? How do you make the transition to a, a wellness-oriented system? away from a sick care system. And, and part of that process is to recognize you have to reset priorities. Because if you're saying, hey, we're just gonna give everybody more of what we're already doing, we're not gonna get to the, the wellness care system we want, first of all, and we're gonna bankrupt ourselves too in the process. So then the question becomes, well, how do we get there? Are we going to get there through a national program, which is Medicare, which currently does not do wellness, does not do prevention, <laughs> but is set up to be an acute care specialty funded system? Are they the people who are going to make the transformation? One of the things that Joan said that I really like is we need a lot of delicate, close negotiations about what we're gonna pay for, how we think about responsibility. I completely agree with Joan in thinking, we care about the wrong kinds of care. And we don't care enough about the caretakers who provide the kinds of care we really need. When I was recently going to the doctor's office and I was told, will you see the nurse practitioner, I did a momentary, do I wanna see the nurse practitioner? Mm -hmm. Is she gonna be good enough? This is gendered, this is hierarchical. Well, you know what? This is the future of medicine, and she's good enough. <laughs> but this ingrained idea of the best medicine is really not good for us. So again, the question becomes, how do you move from that? And do you move from that from a, a national program that's going to change the entire country in this direction? Or do you try to think about it more at the state level? Do you even try to think about it at more local levels? Is there a hospital here in Northfield? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the question, should there be a hospital here in Northfield? Yes. <laughs> what if, what if uh, there's a really great healthcare complex up in uh, the Twin Cities, and maybe you could scale something down here that wasn't quite as expensive for the system as a whole? Unfortunately, these are the, these, these are the kinds of questions that, that people are going to be facing if we really move to a, a different kind of healthcare system. And this is, I say that because it's meant to be kind of shocking because these are the kinds of, of rethinking that we have to engage in. And then the question becomes, do you want to do that at the national level? Or do you want to do that at the local level with uh, people who know the system a little bit better? Because there, there, are, two ways to set, there are two ways to control costs in healthcare. <clears throat> um, and one thing I'm going to say, and this will make me deeply, this will make me deeply unpopular, but I'm sort of in that role anyways. Healthcare is always rationed. Mm -hmm. There's always rationing in healthcare systems. And the reason for that is this. <clears throat> when we, the term ration comes from the term how much food you need per day. So how much medical care do you need per day? Well, no one can answer that question. How much medical care do you need in a year? No one can answer that question because it's based on medical need. So what is rationing? Rationing is denying medically indicated care because it doesn't pay. This happens already in our country. People line up for care. They don't get care because they're not covered. And it also happens in Canada because Canada has decided to allocate its funds in certain directions so that some kinds of care are not provided. So the question becomes, how do you set limits? Because that's the fundamental question. And you can set limits by setting dollar amounts on amounts of care, and that can be gamed very easily or you begin to do the social reprioritization, which I suggest has to happen at a more local level, at least at the level of states, if not lower than that. And so again, for me, a single payer system for a country this vast, diverse, politically fractious, 
I have political <laughs> misgivings, and I have, but more importantly, I have deep misgivings about whether it's going to take us to the kind of healthcare system that I think we both would like to see. Joan, would you like to? Let me take that? 12 seconds to answer, <laughs> maybe 30. <laughs> The way to get rid of some of the anxiety that people have is to provide for universal health of medical insurance. And then once you're there, things can get better. I don't like the idea of using the states because look at what the states have done with Medicaid. It's deeply racialized who gets Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid and who doesn't. Um, the new book by Jamila Michener, published by Cambridge University Press last month, uh, makes this argument. If you want people to be solidaristic, the first thing you have to do is make sure they feel safe. Having universal health care makes everybody feel safe. You don't have to worry that if you lose your job, you're going to lose your care. Once we're there, then we can begin to make the changes that have to be made. And yeah, they have to be made at all levels, and you can't start at the national level. And as I said, you'd need to negotiate within different regions how much money is going to be given per person to pay for health care. There are lots of things that would have to get worked out. At the moment, if we went to a state system, you know who would win? The oligopolistic companies who are very large and able to organize health care um, in a very... You know, it seems like a nice package. And, you know, as my doctor in New York used to say, soon you, we will have a single payer system. It's called United Healthcare. <laughs> well, so, so one of the things I just want to be clear on is I support universal health coverage. Right? This is one of the things I said up front. I support 100% universal health coverage. There are lots of ways to get to 100% universal health coverage. Basic, the basic formula is this. You have compulsory health insurance, and you have compulsory funding. And that's what the single payer is. The single payer is a compulsory insurance system that everybody has to belong to. It's one system. And there's compulsory funding for it. In the Netherlands, they do this through private insurance companies. It, you're compelled to buy insurance. The government provides a certain amount of money, and you have to pay the rest. Same thing happens in Switzerland. Um, there are lots of ways to organize this. I happen to think that the German model is probably the best model to get us there. And there you have a compulsory funding system, in their case paid for by employers and employees and taxes. I would prefer a straight, dedicated health tax that everybody pays. That would be my approach to doing it. And then you have universal coverage that's available through insurance marketplaces, like we already have under the Affordable Care Act except you're not paying for them because they're already paid for. So the only question is, which one are you going to choose among all of the ones that offer the guaranteed public benefits that have been defined? And then those companies are going to compete on the grounds of wellness to try to provide the best kind of care at the lowest possible cost that they possibly can. Now we have a system that's a wellness system that's operating at a local level where people are engaged in complex negotiations we can also have these companies report data, the kind of health outcomes data that people are getting so we can learn about what works and what doesn't work. I think given the prominent role that private insurance companies, originally nonprofit, now some of them for profit, have played in our country, they're not going to go away. This is a one trillion, this is a business that processes one trillion dollars in claims every year. A lot of people work for these businesses. We can only, you can only have so much disruption and get something passed <laughs> in our system where you need 60 senators uh, to support something. And moreover, you have 435 people who can meddle with national policy in terms of what gets paid for and what doesn't get paid for. We need to insulate this thing, and we need to figure out other ways where we can find out what works, where we can assess technologies, and then we fund global payments, again, something I agree with through Joan, but through private insurers uh, at a more local level. That would be my ideal system. So I just want to be clear that I think it's a question of means, not a question of ends in some ways. Before we uh, turn to general Q&A, um, pessimist that I am, um, I'm 
Uh, what I would like to hear from both of you is what bad news, really bad news, comes with your proposals? <laughs> so either one. That's a good question. So, so um, what bad news comes with my proposals? Um, one piece of bad news that comes with my proposal is um, there is going to be limited, choice is going to be more limited in this respect. It's, there's going to be, in my view, a, a, a set of publicly defined benefits that will be covered. I would like them to, them to see. I would like to see them be pretty generous and tilted toward prevention, wellness, chronic disease management, these sorts of things. But not everything's going to be possible. And there's also going to be really tough negotiations between funders who now have a global payment. This is really important. Other countries have a capped health care budget. So at the beginning of the year, they're thinking, how much money are we going to spend this year on health care? Oh, it's this much money. The way the US health care system works is the first thing a hospital administrator asks is, how can we grow our budget this year? How can we grow our budget so that we have the money we need to invest in technology so that we can keep the doctors happy who admit physicians to our, who admit patients to our facility? That kind of technological expansion is going to be capped because it's just there's going to have to be a lot more hard thinking about where the high priced items are going to be allocated to make sure that everybody can be included in a sustainable system that has affordable solidarity. So that is what I would say is the bad news, the two pieces of bad news in my, in my proposal. Joan? Taxes. <laughs> Someone's going to pay for this, and if it's a public system, taxes will go up. Um, but it doesn't have to be taxes on individuals. It could be taxes of some other sort, more creatively. Second, um, there will be disruption of the economy. The healthcare sector is a huge part of this economy. A lot of people work for the companies that are competing for your healthcare dollars. They spend a lot, the guy, the guy who does the Geico voice might lose his job. But I, I'm willing to say that, as I said, that that kind of disruption, although it will be painful, is worth it in the long run. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go to uh, general Q&A and um, people who are interested in posing questions, please raise hands and then someone will come uh, to give you a mic. And please don't pose the question before you get the mic. So, first question. This one up there. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, so we're advocating for a single payer system. And I don't know, I, I personally think it's almost impossible to cover everything. So we would need some sort of entity to decide what is covered, what's not, just to be realistic. Who and how would you form that entity? That's one question. And my second question is, how can you keep innovation going while having a single payer system? Well, you would create an entity. I don't know what kind of entity exactly that would um, consist of probably a board of physicians, nurses, all kinds of healthcare providers, hospitals, and they would make some of those hard decisions. Um, you know, it's a, do you want to insulate from them from the political process? Up to a certain extent, yes, because you don't want them to be lobbied. Do they have to be responsive to the political system? Yes. So these are hard questions. I don't have a really good answer. But the second question about innovation, doctors in the UK innovate. Doctors in South Korea provide really fabulous care for certain kinds of really advanced cancers better than the care that's given in the US. There's no reason to think that innovation is going to stop unless you think that people innovate for the purpose, only for the purpose of making money. And I don't think that's true. Indeed, 
I sometimes run the experiment in my head of asking, if doctors' salaries weren't so high, would we have worse doctors or better? If I can just jump in, that reminds me of a talk I gave <clears throat> elsewhere where a student who was going to medical school said, what you're proposing in supporting the Affordable Care Act is going to prevent the best and the brightest from going to medical school. And I said, I think if you want to go to medical school today, or really any health profession, and you're not committed to wellness, you need to rethink your career trajectory. Because again, this is, this is what we need to be thinking about, is what does a commitment to wellness look like for our population, rather than just uh, doing the fixing people up in the emergency room in, in high-tech care, which I also support, by the way. <laughs> I, I, um, we're talking about not making profit but even a nonprofit organization needs to make profit to keep operating Margin. so my actual question is how are you going to keep the system alive how in order to keep innovation you need to have a profit margin it's it's a kind of really personally i think it's absurd to think that we don't need profit to fund the system how are you going to make that feasible in a single payer system i i guess i should have phrased my question better I guess we disagree. You can call my idea absurd. Well, maybe maybe I'll jump in here too because <laughs> there's a there's so so there's a ter that we've been using the term single payer. I'm going to introduce a, another piece of vocabulary which may be useful, may not be useful. Uh, sometimes people talk about all payer systems, right? So in an all payer system, there are lots of different payers but they all have to follow the same rules. And that's basically what I support. I support all payer systems. So Vermont is interesting, and this is one of the reasons why I wanna put a plug in for states, actually. States are the laboratories of democracy in the United States, and Vermont is institu instituting a new payment system. It's an all payer system, which is gonna cover Medicaid patients in Vermont, and it's gonna provide incentives for private insurers to come in that are going to be quite attractive to private insurers and they're going to provide global payments per patient for the population served based on the population health of that group and then if if those people in that population group do well on 20 different measures of public health the insurance companies are going to get more money they're actually going to be rewarded and the physicians and the hospitals that keep people well are gonna be given more money. So this is where the, the margin or the profit comes from, is you try to set up incentives in a way that people are gonna make money by creating early intervention uh, programs that will really support people's health, re re reduce opioid addiction, these sorts of things. Similarly, if you know what is effective, if we really had good evidence for medical devices and drugs and therapies, if we had really good evidence about that, it would signal to companies, hey, this is where you should be investing your money because these are the areas that are gonna pay well in this system even as other forms of, even as forms of payment for less of high cost, low benefit medicines are ratcheted down. So I think there's still plenty of room. And, and for me, I, I don't see profit as antithetical to a good healthcare system. I think profit can be a mechanism for getting us to the right ends, but the challenge is making sure our system is moving in the right sorts of directions. Um, I this my question is for um, should I stand up or whatever okay my question is for um, Mr. Craig um, so the in the U.S. healthcare system uh, obviously we have a lot of um, private insurers and that inc that leads to large expenditures on administration um, and that also it also leads to higher prices because a single payer system would have monopsony power uh, would have a lot of leverage over. Uh, healthcare providers in lowering prices, um, and I'm just curious, what, why do you think that private insurers are necessary to ensure 
um, the best possible healthcare system, especially because you even said that single payer systems are administered on a regional level. So those regional units can be responsive to the local population and then you can still have the monopsony power of the federal government to lower costs and improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I agree that administrative costs in private insurance companies are astronomically high. Uh, one of the key provisions of the Affordable Care Act was to limit and listen to the terminology, was to, uh, was, to, was to guarantee a certain medical loss ratio, right? A medical loss ratio is the amount of money that insurance companies have to spend covering people's health care. Right? That's a good number, but it's called the medical loss ratio. What are we losing on medical care? Ah! <laughs> right? Well, the Affordable Care Act put in certain minimum percentages that you have to commit to care. They're still quite low, 20% for small private insurance companies, 15%. So there's a big administrative chunk for sure. Uh, and there's a big administrative chunk in physicians' offices and hospitals. One thing we do have to be clear about is whenever we talk about waste and eliminating waste, it means we're eliminating jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, but some jobs should be eliminated. But let's just be clear that we are talking about eliminating jobs when we talk about cutting administrative waste. The other point you're making about the monopsony power to drive down prices, <clears throat> Medicare has something called diagnosis-related groups, which are the ways that Medicare sets prices. So in effect, Medicare can already set certain kinds of prices. We can't set prices on drugs because we're by law forbidden from doing that. Medicare can also not disallow high cost, low benefit treatments, but these are legal issues that we've built in. But let me give you an example. My father just had what's called Mohs surgery, M-O-H-S, to remove a skin cancer from the top of his head, which I'm really glad he was able to have happen. Mohs surgery under Medicare pays a very high rate. And so people who perform Mohs surgery, dermatologists are some of the best paid physicians out there right now because they can provide a lot of procedures allowed by Medicare. So one question is if we're not already doing it, are we really gonna be doing it? The other political question is if you're trying to drive physician salaries down by half, Are the physicians going to go along with that? If it's the big bad government in Washington that's doing it? We've had a debate over what's called the doc fix, which was supposed to be a cap on the amount of money that Medicare would pay for doctors, and then it gets raised every year by Congress because it's seen to be untenable. And they point to primary, primary care physicians. But of course, there are other physicians who make a great deal of money. But if we can already resist this, I'm just not sure the monopsony power, the monopsony power sounds great when you're talking about bad private insurers who everybody hates. But when you start talking about physicians and nurses, I think there's gonna be a lot of political pushback and it's better to do this in more close negotiations. But that's just my view. Mari, do you have a question? I actually have two questions as well. Um, will universal health care, if it is implemented be extended also to illegal immigrants mm -hmm. and non-citizens um, and going along with that how do we deal with the backlash from taxpayers who don't believe that it's their responsibility to be paying for those services to people who aren't citizens of the United States Joan, you want to try that? that? So the question of the status of people who are not citizens is a difficult question politically at the moment. Um, it's fed by the fear that someone is going to take away what I have. Um, I, as I said before, we're in a place of remarkably deep, vicious circles about meanness towards others who are not in our group. The solution to that is not to give in, but to say, no, no, what we'll do is if somebody shows up on the hospital door, on the, you know, the door of the hospital and needs an appendectomy, you do it. Um, I don't, I, you know, I haven't figured out all the details of this, but that's one of the things you would do. So what do you say to the taxpayers? You say, taxpayers, 
how about if we put a sales tax on stock transactions? I mean, there are ways to tax things that don't come back to your income tax check. And, that, and it, it's, there's a lot of wealth in the world. Um, people who are wealthy don't like to be taxed. But we could figure out ways to tax more, to get more tax revenue out of them. Than, but again, we never talk about this. Uh, the debate is always about your tax going up or your income going down $30 a week or a month. That's not what really uh, makes the difference here. So there would be ways to reorganize. Again, we would have to think about reorganizing the way we tax things. I'm happy to have that debate as well. That's a great question. Um, I, we, we currently have a law in the United States called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, um, which has transformed since it was originally passed and now basically means if you come to an emergency room, you will be treated. Um, and that's because this is kind of, this is an institutionalization of inclusion and compassion that is very expensive and irrational, but it is a last chance guarantee. That's not to say it's easy for people who use this. You get dunned by bill collectors forever. You're put on these payment plans. You can go bankrupt, right? I'm not saying this is great, but it is something that the United States has committed itself to. And this is why the individual mandate is so important in the Affordable Care Act because the individual mandate says, because there is this guarantee, everybody has to put something in, mm -hmm. whether it's premiums or taxes or this penalty, everybody has to put something in. So for me, when I think about this, I think there should be a dedicated health tax that everybody pays and everybody pays it. Maybe it's a 10% sales tax that everybody pays. But before you think, oh my gosh, Remember that people who have employer-sponsored benefits will now get that money that their organization dedicates to premiums, right? I can tell you my employer spends about $14,000 a year on my family's health coverage. If there was universal care that came through another mechanism, that $14,000 is now, right, my compensation package. And so maybe I can absorb this 10% sales tax. Um, these are some of the ways that we need to rethink. One thing that <laughs> if we're supporting the single payer system, let's just be clear about, and this is something you're going to hear next week too, the employer-sponsored health insurance system has got to end. It is highly regressive. It benefits wealthy people at the expense of poor people. It's not portable, and it has to end. And this is really scary for a lot of people. But these are the kinds of changes we need to be taking, thinking about really seriously in terms of how they affect us as individuals. I think we need to get there slowly through the Affordable Care Act. And I would suggest that one of the things I would love to see is a public option on the health insurance exchanges that is, and Joan may not like this, Medicaid for all. I think Medicaid should be the expansion vehicle. And the reason I think that is because it's a state level program it sets limits. Wealthy people would suddenly find out what Medicaid actually looks like, and they would agitate for better benefits for everybody who used that system. But wealthy people could pay into Medicaid, and it would be much better and cheaper than buying care on the Affordable Care Act exchanges, especially if you don't get any subsidies. To me, this is the kind of solidarity change that could be really dramatic. Solidarity from the bottom up and at the state level, and then it becomes a real process of educating people what the healthcare system looks like, and getting people in together, and sharing in this thing, and making it work for everybody. So this is the one tweak that I would suggest the Affordable Care Act right now would be a public option that was Medicaid driven.
Hi. Um, so I have a quick question about uh, purely from an administrative side on this wellness-based care idea that we're building off of. Um, for example, I'm from the state of Texas, and it's very geographically diverse course, yeah. and difficult to implement str strategies, even at a state level, that are universally acceptable because you have a desert in the West versus I'm from a town where there are two hospitals a block away from each other and not another hospital for a 100 mile radius. So how far down do we need to break down our administrative care just to make sure everyone is getting equitable wellness care? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. <laughs> So it used to be that in the United States, before you could build a hospital, you had to demonstrate that there was a need for this particular set of medical needs to be met where you were, right? And um, that's kind of gone away now. So um, there are lots of now new POSH systems, that's really the abbreviation for the physician-operated specialty hospitals. Um, but that's not what you're talking about. What you're talking about is the other end. Um, there, well, we don't have a good answer now, and so none of these systems really, in a way, change that except this. There would be ways, or there probably are ways, to think about using technologies to solve some of these problems, and that's, and you know, once again, any one of these systems is gonna have to address and pay for those. The question is which system is going to provide enough extra money to generate some new innovation in these areas. And yeah, it's true that we can't um, not pay anybody anything for innovation, but on the other hand, it, the way we're doing it now, just waiting for some profit center to come along. How, you, the fact that there are hundreds of miles of places with no hospitals is a sign, not of the accuracy or goodness of the present system, but of a need for change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one, of the, one of the goals of wellness is to have more routine visits, mm -hmm. right, where you check your vitals more regularly, you have social workers calling to make sure that you've taken your meds. This all becomes more difficult in rural areas that are widely spread out, right? Um, but that might suggest that we need to be investing more in things like community health centers in rural areas, even if the population numbers are relatively small, uh, because that care needs to be available out there, and maybe these community health centers need mobile vans mm -hmm. that could do certain kinds of, of diagnostic work and and visits, but that's, you know, that's really investing in some of the kinds of care that I think Joan is really pushing for, is to think about what, would it, what, would it, what does it mean to take responsibility for care, not just in the city, but in the rural areas too. Uh, there's a program called Critical Access Hospital Funding. That was preserved under the Affordable Care Act, although some urban funding for, for hard hit hospitals was cut. So there's a certain, I think there's a certain recognition that that's important but you ask a great question. Uh, thank you. So um, I want to make a couple comments, and then I want to ask a couple questions. And uh, I, I have, I'm a state legislator. I happen to be uh, <laughs> author of a single-payer health care plan in the state of Minnesota. And um, one of the... Uh, things that you've t kind of talked about, both of you, uh, is that we do have a regional plan for Im implementing this. And um, uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the things we've looked at, too, is how counties can contribute, and, and they have a agencies that can help with that. Um, w one of the things I, I, I also wanted to mention was that, there, you know, there's a, a little video of uh, Paul Ryan talking with Alan Greenspan about, you know, well, won't there come a time when Medicare and Social Security, will we just can't afford it anymore? And Alan Greenspan's response is, the U.S. government has sovereign currency, and they will never default on Medicare and Social Security. So, uh, I mean, there, on, on the one hand, there's, there's good reason to think that the federal government should be, in a sense, the financial agent 
in providing this. But I agree with you, there's much to be gained by looking at more local kinds of implementation of a single payer system. And uh, I guess one of, my, one of my questions is, as we look at, uh, if, if we didn't go to single payer, if we went to uh, trying to have the insurance companies do, a, in a sense, a better job, that won't happen. I mean, I, from my perspective, I can't see that happening without heavy regulation, without really bringing them to, to, to uh, uh, change their behaviors. This is something we've tried to do in the state of Minnesota, and uh, they get, we get pushed back. We, I mean, we've turned over our public plans to the private insurance companies, and they don't want to open up their books and tell us how they're spending their money. Um, the other part of that, of course, is the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which, you know, they insist they need lots of money to do innovation. We used to have universities do a lot of the innovation that we did, and it was government-sponsored. Um, but uh, so, so, you know, one question is, how do we regulate insurance companies if we're not going to go to a single-payer system? Uh, how do we regulate the pharmaceutical uh, companies? And then, uh, uh, I, I guess, how do we change uh, the perspective of, I mean, I, I think the, one of the major problems with changing our healthcare system is that we need to help people understand that there needs to be a lot more regulation. And I think they would see the benefit from that regulation if they had the kind of system you're talking about, which is wellness-focused rather than sick-focused. Uh, anyway, I'll let you re respond to that. Well, thank you for sharing what's happening in the Minnesota legislature. That's very help helpful. Um, I agree that, that change is going to require heavy regulation um, and ways to regulate health insurance companies include things like um, this, is the, this is the global amount of money you're going to get. Right now it's very hard to limit that because of the employer sponsored health insurance system which provides money from employers who kind of have incentives to pay more and more and more each year to keep people happy while shifting more and more of the cost to their employees who end up paying even more and more and more each year. And so there's this kind of inflationary movement in that direction. So unfortunately, again, I think that the employer-sponsored health insurance, we need to ease away from it somehow. That's one of the key steps here. But in terms of regulations, you can say, you know, you have to spend this much money of your claims on covering health care services. You can set those, you could regulate that, you can enforce that, you're gonna get tremendous pushback, I think, right? Uh, you can develop an all-payer system like Vermont is experimenting with, where you reward insurance companies for health outcomes that their population meets, but you need their data, and if they can withhold their data, that becomes harder to do, right? Um, Massachusetts has, has moved to make uh, prices more transparent so that insurance companies have to be clearer about that. These are some of the regulations I think you can, you can put into place which would basically require more money going out the door for health coverage, um, <clears throat> would reward insurance companies for creating integrated care. Maybe they can work with local providers in the area, accountable care organizations they're called and help support these sorts of things. Uh, but I think it's going to be very hard until we can set a cap on how much money we're spending and pay uh, a kind of global payment to insurance companies based on the number of people they have with risk adjustment. Right now, insurance companies control that until you have a kind of outside regulator who says, this is how much money you're going to get, which I think is your point about a federal financing system, which I would support. Um, you're going to have better answers to this, I think, than I, because you know better <laughs> what's been tried uh, and, and what kind of pushback you're going to get. But those are some of the thoughts that I have. Joan? And I would add that while regulation is a dirty word, there's an awful lot of regulation already going on. And we also have to point out that some of the regulations are passed at the behest of uh, the insurance companies, not just to get them. And it's, you know, the, the complexity here is not, you don't have to go very far to get, the, to get away from just the rhetorical um, 
shout out of drowning government in the bathtub. Uh, and as soon as you get beyond that, then you begin to talk about the fact that there already is an awful lot of regulation going on. These are different regulations, but they serve the public better. Maybe we have time for one more question. This hand here, right in the middle. Thank you so much. Um, I do not know that much about economics and things like that. Um, I am unfortunately a medic going into medicine as opposed to um, economy. I don't but think that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys both mentioned that you think that some sort of health tax would be really beneficial in this um, in this change, which I think is also a great idea, but one of the first things that came to mind for me was the taxes that we currently have for the education system and how the education system is kind of fumbling in many states across, across our country, and I'm thinking more on terms of um, primary and secondary education, not higher education and public universities. Um, but are there concerns for the health tax having some of the problems that we're having with the education tax? Good question. So what you're asking is, once you turn this over to being funded by the public, then once, not you, but politicians start <laughs> saying, well, this is too expensive, we should cut back. Um, then we're gonna end up in a situation where we have a cap and the cap is too low uh, for people's health care. And that would really be a disaster, you're quite right. Um, one has to rely on, uh, well, there are a couple, there's several things that you can do. First of all, Medicare, um, like Social Security, there is, the politicians like to use the language of the lockbox, right, that some money is dedicated to that and it can't be used for other purposes or cut back. So that would be one way to do it. Um, but another way, again, as I suggested before, is to think more innovatively about what kinds of taxes um, we might impose on, on, on in, so that it's not individual taxes. Then people would have to become educated, I agree, so that they know what their tax dollars and which tax do dollars are going where, but you could do that. And finally, I think if people started dying because there wasn't enough money in the healthcare system, yeah, yeah, I know. And I think that if it were more visible and if it were more spread out that this is actually what's happening, I'm not sure people would stand for that for very long. I like, th I, I like this idea of a dedicated tax that people can draw a direct connection from. Here are the taxes we're paying, and here are the healthcare services we're, we're getting. And if we think we have enough healthcare services, given all of the other things we have to pay for, I'm good with the tax. And if we think we're not spending enough, well then we're gonna pressure people to raise the tax. Now you're asking the question, could it go down? Could people say, we want the tax to go lower and lower and lower? I think if you can ensure that it's a tax that covers a universal system where everyone has the same guaranteed benefits, there's going to be a lot of resistance to lowering it. I would allow people to spend after-tax dollars on extra things they want. I'm not against people doing more. Uh, some of the current single-payer systems would disallow that. You can't buy supplemental insurance in Canada for services that are covered by the, by the Canadian system, for example. I would allow that. But one proposal I like, which comes from Ezekiel Manual, uh, is a 10% a value-added tax uh, that everybody pays. And this is, yeah, value-added taxes are regressive. Poor people have to pay the same percentage as, as wealthy people do. But right now, poor people don't get health coverage and they don't get much help getting coverage, so paying 10% would really be an incredible benefit, whereas people who make a lot of money and spend a lot of money would be paying a very large portion of this tax. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing we need to do. Health is a basic good. Health is a basic good. So how do we all get on board with that idea that it's not just a basic good for me, but it's a basic good for everybody in this room and everybody in this country Maybe draw the line of citizens to get things going, but you still have access for people who are non-citizens. 
And that's what I would like to see in a tax and really put it out there for people to say, what do we want? And recall what I said about vicious circles because the other side of that are virtuous circles. When you know that you're paying and everybody's healthier and that people are living longer and they're not dying in the streets and they're not, the, the opioid epidemic isn't in the news every night, that makes people more willing to pay because they know it's working. Thank you. Thank you, Joan and David. And thank you all for coming. Hope to see you next Thursday for the pro market side. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Thanks. This was fun. This was really fun.